just last week, there was another study that came out and said 91% of brands are moving part of their marketing in-house. That's a little misleading because if you're just reading that, it sounds like they're scrapping everything they're doing with agencies and bringing everything in-house. Um, the findings of that study are based on responses from more than 200 senior level marketing and decision makers from brands uh, in-house brands in Europe. But I think we could apply that to brands that are here in the US. Uh, on top of that, 56% say a lack of talent and skills are the biggest obstacles of building an in-house team. So we have brands that are moving digital marketing in-house and more than half of those people say they don't have the right people to do the job. And if you think back to the statistics on the slides a couple of slides ago, where 20% of people don't have or are getting the training they need to, to fulfill their, their job obligations. Um, there's also this wider concern that in-house marketing could be an impediment to being creative with your marketing and also long-term term strategic planning uh, is being prioritized over short-term ROI goals. So if you have somebody that's giving you direction to say, we want to see X percentage growth in three months, six months, a year, that's really short term in the, in the scale of all your marketing goals. Wider goals, it's to come up with strategy, an SEO strategy, digital marketing strategy that you can roll out over say one to three years. Um, so there's, there's some things at, at odds there. But why, why are people making this decision <laughs> if, if the data, these studies are telling us different things? Well, the first reason is financial reasons. Brands are looking to cut expenses across their enterprise and bringing marketing efforts in-house seen as an easy way to do that. Number two, they've had agencies like you see here drive their SEO and content marketing strategy for a while. And the results are, well, what you'd expect from a chicken. Uh, now brands are looking for greater control over their marketing efforts. Let's get the chickens out of here and let's do it ourselves because it can't be worse than what we have. This is short-sighted thinking, but I think it goes, feeds nicely into this is brands just want to know more. They want to know where their dollars are being spent, what they're getting for their return on investment. So they want to know everything. Which brings us to the final point, you want greater transparency. So one of the challenges that agencies have is being transparent and sharing all their work. And if you're not doing that, there's a disconnect between an agency like Vertical Measures and a brand. It doesn't matter what agency is, if you're not reporting everything you're doing, if you're not telling a client specifically what needs to be implemented, all these things that you rely on an agency to do, if it's not transparent, you're gonna make a decision to take your marketing in-house. But is that really the right decision and, and what's needed for a successful in-house team? So regardless of what option you choose, the elements for success are the same. So to score a perfect 10 from your C-level suite or board of directors, you need these things, a team, a tool, the right tools, time, and buy-in. So before you can do anything else, you really need the right people in place. You need to assemble a team of experts. In a perfect world, your digital marketing team should include people that fit these roles. Uh, the challenge is that many people claim to be well-versed in SEO. And the trick is to find somebody internally that would know who would be a good fit for your company. Do they have the right skills? Um, do they have the experience and technical know-how to, to do it right for your organization? It's interesting because as an agency, we feel, we feel those same challenges. When we grow, we need to find more people. And speaking from recent experience, it's, it's a real challenge. There's a lot of people that look good on paper um, that are not really so advanced in their uh, SEO thinking when they come in for an interview, um, which goes back to the next slide. So if you're thinking about the statistics I showed earlier, if you're looking at building a team internally, the statistics aren't very encouraging. Training's difficult, it's time consuming and expensive. 
So you've made, let's, let's fast forward a little bit and let's say you've got your team in place. You've got people to do the job, do the work. The next thing you're gonna need is you're gonna need tools. If you've ever done any type of home improvement, you know having the proper tools is critical to doing the job right. And if you don't have the right tools, usually go out and purchase them or maybe you borrow them from a neighbor. <laughs> uh, SEO tools you can't borrow, um, so you need to purchase them. Um, the challenge is, is that there's a lot of tools out there and it's easy to spend upwards of $3,000 a month on tools annually for for what you're trying to do. Um, tools like SEO Clarity or SEM Rush, where you get ranking data, um, tools like Deep Crawl and Screaming Frog to crawl your website, and other tools to review backlinks and your content. It all it all adds up. It can be a pretty good expense over the course of a year. You also have that knowledge to set up the tools and understand what the data is telling you about your programs. So it can be a steep learning curve. Uh, the, the bigger question is, do you have time to do that? So it's not frequently that someone is just has the opportunity to focus on, on data. A lot of organizations don't have somebody that's a data analyst. Um, some do, but majority of clients that we work with don't. They rely on somebody externally to do that. If you're doing it in-house, you need somebody with that expertise. And a better question is, do you have the time? Do you have time to, to analyze data? Do you have time to come up with recommendations for your website, just time to dedicate to SEO projects. This is probably one of the bigger challenges that an organization faces. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide because it's <laughs> a little hypnotic, but just think about this. So if you're adding SEO to the job responsibilities of your existing marketing team, that hamstrings the success of your SEO campaigns. And when you're hamstrung, you feel like you're going nowhere fast. Even if you expand an existing team with people whose sole focus is SEO, you need to ask yourself questions like, does your existing team have the bandwidth to complete multiple projects at the same time on time? Do your projects rely on people from other departments such as IT, PR, or branding who have a lot of other stuff on their plates, can't immediately focus on what you're trying to do with SEO? And then finally, do you have financial incentives tied to the success of your SEO programs? Um, that's, that's one that we see more and more where bonuses are awarded based on how much traffic is coming from organic, whether it can grow X percent year over year. Uh, if, if you have an in-house team and you have those goals in place, yeah, you have all this resistance from other departments, it, it really makes it difficult. Uh, so if, if you're fighting all these fights internally, where does your time as an SEO go? Well, a lot of marketers spend their time trying to get their colleagues to focus their attention on SEO just for a second. Look over here, just for a second, just to see how cool SEO can be. And uh, I, I'm sure everybody's seen the meme come to the dark side, we have cookies. This is a little version of that. SEO is cool, it can do all this stuff. Uh, so to put it another way, the in-house SEO spends most of their time advocating for buy-in, showing people, look what our competitors are doing, what, look what other people in our space are doing, educating them. They're not spending time doing work that moves the needle. A lot of times it's showing what the competition's doing. So once your internal teams or colleagues see the light and they say, wow, that's, those are, statistics are amazing. How, <laughs> tell me how we can do that. Well, thank you for the enthusiasm, Mr. Defoe. So if we go back to think about that fork in the road, there's a third option that we hear vertical measures like. And it's, taking the best of what an agency does along with the best of what you can do in-house. Uh, it works really well for large brands. It also works for any size of, of enterprise. It's what we call a blended approach, approach. So this option combines, like I said, the best of an agency's capabilities with your team. It lets you piggyback on our expertise and resources yet you focus on implementing best practices and building a culture of SEO across your organization. So 
today, if, if people think SEO is, is a dirty word and they don't think it's doing anything, this type of model kind of helps you lean on an agency and, and build that culture within your organization. So we like it because it lets us focus on the work that we're really good at, which is build an audience that you own and leverage it for real revenue growth. So regardless of whether or not you choose to hire an agency outright or to go with a blended approach, a good agency offers several advantages. So the first of the advantages is that when you hire an agency, you get a team of people to work on your campaign. You get the benefit of what that agency's learned working on other SEO campaigns, applying that knowledge to your website. Combined, the team of SEO strategists here at VM has more than 60 years of experience working in the SEO space. That's pretty powerful. So if you think about if you have an internal team that's working on SEO collectively, how much time and years do you guys have working on SEO? Uh, the other thing to think about is using an agency lets you pivot between different service lines. So it's not really uncommon for us to be working on SEO engagement and we identify the need for a client to expand content in a service area or service line or product line that's really un underrepresented on their website. So we might brainstorm with our content development team, come up with content that that client can add to their website. So we have the ability to pivot and maybe offer a wider array of services. And that's something that's difficult to do if you're doing everything internally. Finally, those tools that I showed you earlier, um, we use these and a lot more other like them every day. Uh, probably one of the biggest advantages is that we have relationships with a lot of these organizations and we have their ear. So if there's feature requests or things that we see that they can improve, uh, we, we actually make those requests and get them to improve their tools. And in some instances, they'll actually do some of the uh, data gathering for us. Another important factor of hiring an agency is that a good agency will educate you on everything from basic optimization to technical solutions for things like site migrations, URL strategy, and more. And with that education, you can manage more SEO projects with your internal teams in the future. We also work to stay abreast of SEO trends. That's a full-time job in itself because the industry is changing what seems like every day. Um, so to date, Vertical Measures has published two books on SEO and content marketing. We've got another one in the, in the works. It's going to be published soon. In addition to that, we have more than 80 webinars on our website, cover everything from SEO to content marketing to lead nurturing. Uh, and then finally, there's content, there's SEO resources that um, are available for download. And we have the question is, how do you guys keep developing so much of that material is well, we do it to stay abreast of the industry and to stay ahead of the competition. Finally, a good agency has a process and they use it. This is one of the things that I've found really unique to, to Vertical Measures is that we have a team of process map mapping experts who really push us to, to make our work better. And the result of that is, is that it makes sure that everything we do is is intertwined and most importantly that process incorporates analytics into our SEO work and other digital marketing efforts uh, to make sure that our work is driving results so for all of our clients we look at KPIs from across the customer journey make sure those actions are tracked analyzed and refined for some clients clients it's as simple as looking at how many people fill out a lead form for other clients it's looking at heavily trafficked pages, testing calls to action on those pages, and then measuring the effectiveness of the lead nurture that is tied to those pages and those campaigns. So when we look at the data and we combine that collaboration with clients and our own teams, it really ensures that we're measuring results in greater detail and accuracy than what the majority of our clients can do independently. 
Um, the bottom line is if you want to track something, we'll figure out a way to do it. So when we have our clients buy in and they implement our, uh, implement our SEO recommendations, the results are outstanding. This trend line here shows that 12 months down the road, a year after a year, clients see 66% increase in organic traffic. That's the average increased traffic that clients, all VM clients see after a year. When we extend that out, out to two years, it's more than double that. So 167% organic traffic growth after two years for all of our clients. Again, the key is, is just that buy-in at the executive level and also buy-in from the people that you're working with day to day. Uh, thing to think about here is that organic success doesn't always happen overnight. It can take a while to get results. So even if you're on this path where you have buy-in and you're doing the right things, depending on the obstacles you have on your website and getting up to speed, the growth starts out as slow. But then once you actually have buy-in and you've got a good cadence going, your traffic explodes. And then also the ROI in your campaigns improves even more. Metrics like cost per lead, cost per sale become much more efficient. One of the cool things is about SEO is that it scales really well. So once you achieve results in one area, it's, it's relatively easy to repeat the process and roll that process out to other business units, other countries more efficiently. So our, our SEO work does not live in a silo. We're usually combining with efforts from other channels. So for example, um, a 58% increase in conversion rate optimization has benefits for SEO performance. We get more, more uh, sales, more leads converted when we add CRO to an SEO campaign. Also keyword learnings from something like paid search where it's really quick and easy to test keywords to see if they resonate with your audience are good for SEO. We can learn uh, about opportunities to add to our organic campaigns. That's really where our process pays off is that integration across, across channels. Uh, a, a lot of agencies talk about it and say they do it, but we're really good at putting that into practice as our results have shown. Finally, if your SEO agency says something like your results are underwhelming or I'm not getting what I'm paid for, there's one last benefit using an agency or in multiple agencies to help you with your marketing. It's a lot easier to fire an agency than it is to fire employees. And it's hard for me to say that, but that's, that's a reality. Uh, so you can learn quickly um, from an agency. And if it turns out, if it's not a good fit with your, your brand, your organization, it's relatively easy to, to get an agency loose. Are there any questions? Hey, Seth. All right. That was great. That was awesome. Um, I really, uh, I love that picture of the, the process mapping. It's so crazy how much work we put into that and, and just how, how crazy digital marketing is as a whole. Um, yeah, we do have a few questions that we want to go through. Um, first of all, I, I, I didn't know you were an ice dancer. Yeah, neither did I. <laughs> I, I just started doing that recently. Oh, that's uh, awesome. Which, which is cool. My my wife's been a figure skater for years, and uh, just something we started to do together. Well, you have to, you'll have to invite us out when you start doing the triple sows and all that <laughs> fun stuff. Okay, so back to real questions. Uh, the first one is from Edward Stodolsky, and he asked, uh, I do own my own SEO, or I do my own SEO, so is there a free SEO evaluator I can use? Yeah, so that's... That's a, a very broad question. There's a couple tools that, that I always recommend to people. Uh, and one is Screaming Frog, so you can crawl your website, identify issues, uh, learn what things on your website you can fix from a technical standpoint. And then for, for rank tracking, SEMrush is a ton of free data, and you can learn a lot from the, the free version of that. And also, if you just want to step up for a, a paid account, you can pay 99 bucks a month. Uh, on a month-to-month -month basis and get even more data. And that's in addition to what you could get for free from Google Analytics and, and Search Console. Um, the, the key with any tool, I always tell people this, is that you don't have to know how to use the data. 
the tools the tools show to you if you don't really know exactly what you're looking at it can be paying for a tool can't be can be uh just a waste of money Okay. Kind of going on the same lines of maybe someone who can't afford an agency, uh, John Triplett asked, for a small business with a limited budget, budget, what can they do to improve their SEO in 2019? Yeah, that's a great question. There, there are a few things I, I think uh, anybody can do, even if you're doing SEO yourself. First is just making sure your website's free of technical errors. Uh, it's gotten a lot easier to publish websites than it used to be even five years ago. But I think what happens is a lot of people spend a lot of time publishing and, and working through their site quickly without really thinking about maintaining it, maintaining the health of a website. So they're creating new pages, deleting all other pages. You end up with a lot of 404 errors, things like that. So just making sure your site's free of any technical errors. Make sure that the very basic stuff is done this sounds cliche, but I there's tons of room for opportunity just in just general on-page optimization. Uh, addition to that, making sure you're using schema. Schema is a huge thing as it does impact things like uh, your local visibility and also visibility for things like featured answers and featured snippets. Uh, making sure that your site is good from a mobile perspective Google has some pretty powerful free tools that will help you with that. There's also other tools that you can investigate online that will help you with mobile. Um, and then finally, just a user experience. It's amazing what you can learn by uh, trying out Lucky Orange and looking at some heat mapping or visit recording to see exactly how people are interacting with the website. You'll, you'll see the, the, the things that they have trouble finding or if they have trouble navigating your your e-commerce cart, things like that. It's, it's really transparent, it's very powerful, and you can try that out for free. And then finally, just creating more content. And that's just not lip service. I think it's, if you're not creating content, you're missing out on the opportunity to um, build your audience. So at a very basic level, we always recommend that people talk about the topics their customers are asking them about every day writing articles to talk about those things, adding that content to applicable service and product pages, and then distributing that new content in social channels uh, just to get it out there so people n know what you're talking about. Okay, so this one's a little bit more of a broad question, but Luke asks, can you specify some more advanced SEO tactics? Yeah, that's that's very... That's very broad. Um, so I think one of the things that, that we've noticed a lot lately is that uh, if you're familiar with the Google Medic update that hit last late last summer, last fall, uh, a lot of people are saying that was based on your money or your life sites. And I think if we step back away from, from that and you look at, the Google Eat signal, so your your expertise, your authority, authoritativeness, and uh, the trust signal that, that Google sees when they visit your website. I think that's a huge opportunity that a lot of sites are not capitalizing on. So if you do create a lot of content, make sure that you're really transparent about who's writing it, why they're an expert, why a reader or Google would think they are an authority in the space, promote your accreditations. Uh, Google's come out and said some of those things don't really matter, but if it improves a user experience, it matters. Um, speed, page speed, doesn't get more technical than that. That's, that's something I think is not going away. And just being, making sure that uh, page speeds load, page pages load in three seconds or less. And that, depending on the complexity of your website is, is a big thing. That's sorry. It's a very broad question. Uh, it's hard to provide really detailed guidance on things like that, but um, there's a lot going on, but I, I want I guess just the thing I can stress is that the basics still matter and, and just try not to overthink things too much. Just rely on what data tells you and, 
make adjustments there where, where necessary. There's no, usually with SEO, there's no magic bullet. It's just working on those things you, you know you need to fix and uh, going from there. <clears throat> okay, uh, and Luke, I do want to add, uh, Seth does have a really tremendous video coming out in the beginning of February. Uh, check back on our blog around then. Uh, it's going to dive into all of what he just said, so it, it's really going to be beneficial and hilarious. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, we're, we got a couple questions from Fergus that we want to uh, ask now, and the first one is, what is the industry average uh, hourly rate for SEO? There are false promises that pay... Uh, if you pay X amount of dollars to get on page one, and he just wants to see what the appropriate hourly rate should be. Yeah, so that's that's an interesting question. So I think the rate really varies depending on whether or not you're going to hire an independent SEO or you're going to hire an agency. Um, there's organizations that, that publish studies on this every year. Um, so in June of last year, Ahref, which is a backlinking uh, data warehouse, they published a study that found that 88% of SEOs charge $150 per hour or less. And of that group, 50% are charging somewhere between $75 and $200 per hour. So the majority are, are spending or, or majority of SEOs are charging $150 an hour, but you might be able to find somebody as low as 75 to as high as $200 per hour. The challenge with that is that um, a lot of what an SEO is going to do depends on just the relationship you're going to have with them. So that's look more than just the, the amount of money you're going to spend per hour. And then anybody that says, they'll get you on page one for X amount of dollars. Just stay away from that, those types of <laughs> SEOs or I don't think there's many agencies that would make that promise. And the reason for that is if they're promising you results like that and they're promising them quickly, chances are that they're doing something nefarious that you might get results in the short term, but frequently it's going to result in a, in a site penalty. Uh, well, Fergus uh, also had a follow-up question, not really related entirely, but he goes, uh, now that Google is creating their own meta descriptions, do you think there is still weight in spending time to optimize those descriptions? Yeah, you know, that's that's really frustrating. Um, it's not really clear why they're doing that, but we've, we've noticed that a lot here too. Just Google is not using the meta description provided to them in the cut of the page as frequently as they are just taking it from snippets of text in the page. Uh, I will say that your best opportunity for, for driving uh, click-throughs from search results is to keep using a well-crafted meta description. And if you, if you do that and it's unique from the copy on the page, you're still going to get visibility for those results. Uh, that will display your your meta description over what Google is generating occasionally. And I, I think just looking at uh, the data in Search Console, you'll get an idea of uh, which ones will actually have a higher click-through rate, the ones Google crafts or the ones you're crafting yourself. I, I would keep experimenting with that. I know that's something that we still do for all, the, all of our clients. We're still pushing on a meta description and uh, we're pushing on that length that's the traditional length of 155 characters or less, even though um, in some instances, Google is still testing those three line meta descriptions and search results. Okay, so this one's gonna kind of dive into uh, a little bit behind the, the curtain with VM, but uh, Nathan asked, under the umbrella of the VM hybrid, what are the roles of the agency and the brand? Uh, who does strategy, who implements suggestions, et cetera? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting, ah, a little tongue-tied, so apologize. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited about this one. So it's interesting because it really varies depending on every client that we work with. So on some clients that are mature, they might actually have a, their own content marketing strategy, but they need help with technical SEO. 
uh, if it's a client like that, that's not a huge brand that is willing to provide access to the back end of a website, we've actually worked with brands like that that will say, hey, here's a login to our CMS. We want you guys to implement these SEO changes for us. We're gonna take things on, on the strategy side. We've worked with other agencies that say, well, we have a content strategy, but we haven't really used it. It just sits in a drawer in someone's office and we're not crazy about it. Would you guys like to give us an updated content strategy? So when we do that, there's different layers of strategy that we can provide. We, uh, everything from audience development and personas to ideating content, and then we turn that content ideation over to a client that actually creates the content. Uh, and then for, for some of those types of clients, they actually like to handle the implementation themselves. It really kind of depends on the level of comfort that a brand has with an agency. And we're, we do it any number of different ways. But I think the, the power of doing that is if you know what your, your brand or your enterprise is good at uh, and you're open to collaborating with an agency, that's where you're going to get the best results, regardless of who does the work. If you, if you keep that line of communication open and you work together, you'll, you'll have the best results in the end. So kind of continuing on that, more diving into the beginning of a relationship, uh, Christy asked, what does the initial evaluation process look like for a new client when deciding the path uh, to success? What can we expect from the agency initially to earn our trust? Uh, put me on the spot. <laughs> um, I think the last part of that question is really the important part. What, 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 what can an agency do to earn your trust? Right, so I think... I think for us to gain trust with the client, one of the things that I've seen that, that resonates really well is if we understand your, your pain points and we understand the challenges that you're facing and we see ourselves fit into a role that will help, help you uh, solve those problems. Um, and I think it depends, depends a lot on just the, the strategy that we kind of hash out at the beginning of, of, uh, of our, it, it starts before, before we'd actually begin any work. It's sitting down with you, figuring out what your, what your goals are, where you are currently as far as reaching those goals, and then what the, what's, what the obstacles are. And then based on those initial findings, we kind of craft our engagement to, to, to solve those problems. Um, one of the cool things about that part of the process here is that if, if we get that transparency from a client up front where they say, okay, here's, here's our uh, Google Analytics or here's our Adobe Analytics, take a look at it, tell us w where we're going wrong. We spend some time and energy up front just identifying the opportunities on the website how, how you're doing compared to your competition and sharing that information with you and then figuring out a roadmap for how to drive that relationship. Um, I think that's, that's the biggest thing. And, and knowing that we just have expertise and, and a lot of verticals. And I think when you, when you see, when we share some of the things that, we've learned in our experience working in those ver verticals that match what you're trying to do. It's, it's really powerful. <clears throat> okay. Well, we have time for one more question and this is a good one. It's from, I believe it's Ariane. I could be pronouncing it wrong. I apologize. Uh, and she asks, uh, what are, or can be the impacts um, of not having any work being done in terms of SEO and organic growth management. She's from a medium-sized company. Uh, this doesn't seem to be a priority for my boss, uh, who has great restrictions with hiring an in-house marketer or a marketing company. That is an extremely uh, frustrating situation. Uh, I almost included a chart on this. When it uh, when it comes to just not putting in our energy and dollars in SEO, the very basic level, you're losing traffic. Uh, I say this because your competition's 
probably putting time and energy into SEO and they're likely pushing your site down in search results, but you're also not looking at ways to, to grow an audience and keeping them engaged. <laughs> so um, I'm thinking back to that, the chicken driving the car again. So if you're not doing SEO, that's an entire channel that's being ignored. Um, so you don't have any control over it. The other th way to think about it, so if, if you're not doing SEO, chances are you're doing paid search, you're doing display, you're doing something else. So what ends up happening is if, if, you, if you stop your efforts in those other channels, what ends up happening is that if those dry up and you're not doing SEO, it can have pretty broad ramifications on your business in terms of revenue growth, uh, growth in your leads, things like that. <clears throat> okay, uh, Seth, thank you so much. That was a really great Q&A. We got a lot of great questions. Um, thank you again for taking the time to present today. That was great. Uh, we're really excited about next month's webinar, as we were this month. Uh, it's going to be with our paid media expert turned account manager, Tiger Wrench. He's going to tell you what you're doing or how you're doing paid media wrong. Don't worry. He's also going to tell you how to fix it. Uh, registration will begin in early February and will continue throughout the month. So just be on the lookout for that. Until then, I'm Zach from Vertical Measures. Good luck with your digital marketing in 19 uh, and have a great day. Thanks again, Seth. Thank you.